Howdy folks! Today we continue our adventure into the Avatar universe through the Legend of Korra, where magical bending mixes with technology to explore the question, what if a city were made entirely of metal? So over the next however many minutes, we'll explore that concept as described by the city of Zhao Fu, and how the engineering mechanics behind this works from both an in-universe and a realistic perspective. So to kick us off with a bit of context, the Legend of Korra leaps us forward in the Avatar The Last Airbender timeline by a couple of generations and many decades of technological advancement. In Republic City, where much of the series takes place, we see a mirror of 1930s New York City, full of brick-laden skyscrapers and assembly line produced vehicles. Though it has its global influences, with this City of Lights-esque Skyfall Tower that Korra and Bolin visit, and an East Asian aesthetic flair assigned to the crowns of, uh, everything. Early on, at least, it would seem that despite having access to bending abilities, the engineering and architectural advancement closely follows the history of Earth, but with an accelerated timeline, going from feudally organized and designed cities like Ba Sing Se in Aang's world, to a modern metropolis with high-rises and city councils in Korra's age. All still pretty earthly in that regard, though mechanical engineers seem to receive the greatest boon with mecha suits and taser gloves. So as someone who appreciates when fantasy worlds push the needle of creativity in their world building, which the original series did so well, I was ecstatic when the story finally took us to the city of metal, Zhao Fu. Arriving via airship, Korra, the crew, and us viewers are introduced to a beautiful, gleaming city that takes a surprising form. Instead of the rigidly rectilinear shapes of modern steel construction, Zhao Fu almost seems organic, with the water lily forms that house the differing districts of the city in a way that simultaneously subverts expectations while being totally aligned with the method behind its construction, metal bending. And so that brings us to the first topic of this video, a shallow dive on the mechanics of metal bending. And it kind of has to be shallow since physics and bending don't line up as much as I would like. Even still, the creators of Avatar showed us some great uses of the ability, and it's consistent enough that we'll want to evaluate the technique as a means for understanding how it impacts the architectural possibilities. Beginning, of course, with the first metal bender, Toph Beifong. No way am I going in that metal monster. I can't bend in there. The origin of metal bending starts in the middle of the original Avatar series, after Aang's friend is captured by thugs and placed in a metal coffin of sorts, which at the time was the preferred method for entrapping earthbenders, and thanks to her seismic sense or ability to perceive minute vibrations, she detects the pieces of earth that remained within the metal. <laughs> As a brief aside, while Toph's seismic sense is reminiscent of how many animals have better vibration sensitivity than humans, uh, particularly evidenced in response to the 2005 tsunami that swept south Southeast Asia, but I noticed it's probably more similar to non-destructive evaluation methods for structural systems. Like ultrasonic testing in metals, or impact echo tests in concrete which interpret the wave responses in the base materials to determine specifically if there are any voids or interstitial elements. So Toph uses this knowledge of where these interstitial elements of bits of earth are, and bends the pieces within the metal to become the world's first metal bender. Fast forward to the age of Korra, many police in Republic City are now metal benders, of course led by Toph Beifong's daughter, Lin. They're clad in metal armor and use omnidirectional, I mean, <clears throat> they bend metal wires to capture criminals and move more freely in all directions. And it's clear early on in The Legend of Korra that metal bending is going to play a much larger role, to the point that we'll need to be selective about how we discuss it, otherwise we could be here all day talking about the ways it works. Uh, shallow dive, right? Oh, well, <laughs> you can go ahead and let me drown now. Okay, so while Young Toph mostly crumpled thin plates of the material, when we advance the generation we see much more controlled bending. In-universe explanations could come down to better technique after years of practice, uh, perhaps combined with better metals to bend, uh, with more equally distributed earth elements. Uh, speaking of which, apparently some metals, like platinum, are refined to such a degree that no earth remains, uh, completely negating a metal bender's ability to manipulate the material, which is a significant plot point. Uh, I'm afraid you won't be able to metal bend that wall, Chief Beifong. It's solid platinum. You won't get out unless the metal clan taught you a way to bend platinum. Don't bother trying to metal bend out of these. They're platinum. The mechas from season one are covered in it, and so are any handcuffs. So basically, anything the authors needed to close the loophole on, literally and figuratively, the purest form of blood armor. 
On the other hand, the easiest thing to bend besides this uh, random floor plate is the training space rock with uh, unique properties. Uh, and this is one of the few examples we see of the molecular structure of a metal truly being malleable, like resembling water bending. Because of the mechanics originally described, we most often see metal being ripped, bent, or just moved. I mean, think about it, we never really see metal plates being combined or reformed into a whole new piece of metal that wouldn't follow the universe logic that they've set up. No metal forging, metal casting, and so on. But how else do we combine metal? The metal bender solution would likely be to use riveted connections, which lodge dozens of unthreaded bolts between plates to connect, and that would have been a sweet bit of historical accuracy to match the construction techniques of the technological era that Cora aims to emulate. Otherwise, it looks like they have the technology to use welding to combine metals, but that starts to fall more in Asami's court, which of course she flexes when they're caught out in the desert. But the metal bending, ripping, and manipulating are the methods we'd be most concerned with, since deviations like the metallic poison bending or defining what Earth even is will only serve to muddy the waters. Shifting the discussion, I want to think a little more critically about what it means to manipulate solid metal from a physics perspective. Starting at the molecular level, metals are usually found in crystalline atomic structures, which are incredibly dense and have incredibly strong bonds, though not flawless as the Avatar universe correctly pointed out about the bits of Earth. But ironically, these imperfections can actually make the material stronger, as they serve to cause additional friction along failure planes when the bonds try to slip past each other. That's why pure iron is significantly weaker than an iron and carbon alloy, also known as steel. Then when a metal is undergoing literal bending, there are internal forces, tension and compression, that are resisted by the bonds. And in order to bend a piece of steel, let's say, from its original shape, the tension stress needs to exceed the yielding strength of the material, which for most structural steel occurs between 36,000 pounds per square inch and 80,000 pounds per square inch. But if we were to release that loading immediately, then the metal will return to its original shape, unbent and likely making Lin very mad in the process. But we call it the yield strength for a reason, meaning when we load steel in this way, if we hold that load or exceed it, the metal will yield and continue to deform, and if unloaded, will retain some portion of deformation, leaving the material bent. And for the most part, the metal we see bent in The Legend of Korra wouldn't violate these principles, uh, bar the meteorite, though it would speak to the incredible strength required to manipulate such a material. And while it's hard to bring up bending of metal without also mentioning fatigue or the loss of strength due to repeated loading, uh, that doesn't really seem to occur in The Legend of Korra. Most metals are kind of single-use, if you will. They're bent once, and we move on. So, armed to the teeth with this knowledge, let's venture forward to visit the metal city of Zaofu. Founded by Toph's other daughter, Su Yin, and her husband, the architect Batar, about 40 to 50 years after the end of the original Avatar series, Zaofu consists of five different sectors connected by monorails. Besides looking a lot like the future if meme, the city does intend to convey attitudes about the future. As it's first introduced to us, we're treated to imagery of an airport of sorts, uh, extending into an array of rail lines that Team Avatar uses to move to their destination in town, as many modern cities today have in their transportation networks. Compared to Republic City, it certainly feels like an advancement on the Satomobile Field streets. Though ironically, the railway support system doesn't seem to have much concern for advanced engineering, employing what looks to me like an oddly inefficient arch bridge. Whereas even Republic City has something nearly identical to the Manhattan Suspension Bridge. While maybe creative, they could have done more to lean into that curvilinear line work elsewhere. Like how architect and engineer Santiago Calatrava does in his bridge work. And that, to me, is one of the brilliant elements of design that metal bending can really be effective for. While modern steel construction is limited by a list of available shapes or behind the paywall of custom fabricated sections, bending should be able to break out of that mold, like they do with metal pedals used in Sue's dance. So with buildings no longer confined to rectangular shapes, we're afforded metal filigree elements crossing the windows, and of course everything is clad in a bright reflective silver-colored metal, as we all know, this is the real mark of the future. future. 
Needless to say, siding like this, if reflective, would make for an absurdly harsh environment with the sun's rays bouncing off every surface, blinding folks, and frying everything in sight. But in an even more futuristic fashion, Saofu can't be safe without some form of physical protection, and old school bossing say style walls won't cut it in the age of the airship, so they've got themselves covered by taking that water lily form quite literally and using these seemingly ornamental features to close up shop each night, uh, just like a flower, and cover all three dimensions. And this concept is seriously cool, uh, taking engineering cues from drawbridges with some extending elements. Uh, and these petals are stated to be coated in platinum, like many of the elements of the universe that are intended to be unbendable. But it's very likely that it's not just the petals that are coated in platinum, but I believe that just about every building in Fu would need to be clad in the rare material. If it were anything else like steel, aluminum, or even silver, the buildings would be quick to corrode. Even materials like stainless or galvanized steel only serve to inhibit the process of corrosion. So we need something like platinum, which simply doesn't corrode. Granted, even most of the jewelry, for example, that's made with platinum is only a 95% pure material, with the extra 5% going to other alloys that benefit the material in some ways. Now on this channel dedicated to engineering, I'd feel like I'm shortchanging my viewers if I didn't at least pretend to get into some numbers. So in short, US Geological Survey data have estimated the total amount of platinum ever mined at about 10,000 metric tons, or a cube that's about 8 meters wide on each side, or more or less the size of a small house. If that sounds small to you, it really should. If the average Zalfu habitat sphere is something like 500 meters in diameter, the last 150 years of platinum mined on Earth would coat each of the petals only 300 microns thick. That's not to mention all of the other uses defined in the story. So then perhaps in the same way that we view the world of Avatar to be very different from Earth in size, it would appear that its constitution would relegate platinum from an incredibly rare Earth metal to something much more common like iron. As an engineer, I really appreciate some good exposed structure, and it's certainly become more popular recently, though not in the brutalist manner, but in something more like an architecture of minimalism. That said, it's hard to believe that the platinum we see on each surface, just about anywhere, would be anything more than a side paneling. Uh, that is pretty common in modern construction, but usually for cheap, uh, unesthetic buildings. Which of course is borne out when we go inside of the buildings of Zhao Fu and we're greeted by the warmth of wooden halls and furniture, as opposed to a cold steel flooring. I mean, metal isn't necessary everywhere. Though the primary structural frames for these buildings can be made of metal in the same manner as we conventionally do, or even did in the 1930s. Now I'm starting to trend towards a world of speculation that gets a little fuzzy. The issue is that the Legend of Korra deviates from its predecessor in at least one major way. With all of the elemental bending already defined in a world seemingly known to us, the colorful world building of Aang's avatar story fades into the background. Like when he first visits Omashu, we're made to feel that this place is full of shoots and ladders and is alive. The characters really interact with it. Not that they don't at all in Korra's story, but there's a fair bit of focus on healing family relations that seems to, if not take the place, then at least nudge world building's territory to the side. Lastly, uh, since it's tangential, and I will say I'm not well versed in animation practices, but even the backgrounds feel sketched in at times, with uh, negligible amounts of detail. And I can understand that it's an artistic choice, but it gets to the point that Zhao Fu starts to feel, as it's shown in Sue's office, a, a model, a, not exactly a real place, but still just an idea that at least I wanted to be fleshed out. Sorry for a bit of a downer end to the video. Uh, ultimately, the idea of a metal-clad city is still a really fun thought, uh, even if it symbolizes early 2000s visions of advancement more than something that might, you know, happen anywhere. An interesting thought experiment, uh, nonetheless. Uh, thanks for watching, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Adios.